where we see a lot of winter going on in America. And you, and you, as you have a, a, a dialogue and equity series, it perhaps makes sense to try to really interrogate this whole question of equity and what does equity look like? I wanna make sure that you understand that equity is not simply a buzzword that we use to throw around because it's a cute title to your luncheon series, but rather it's important to understand the concept and what we mean. And what, why I want to focus on that a minute is because if you go back in history, given this is African History Month, one of my favorite books written was a, a text by Dr. King in about 1967, if I remember right, that was called, Where Do We Go From Here? And it was interesting that he wrote it in 66 to publish it in 67. But in that text, he really argued about the fact that coming off of the heels of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, those were historical achievements. And yet, why do we write a book in 67 a year later about where do we go from here as if somehow we hadn't done much? Well, the challenge was that while those particular pieces of legislation and all the struggles and the dogs and hoses in Birmingham and desegregation in schools and bombing churches with little girls and all the things that folk had done to be able to achieve that legislation. It had enhanced the awareness of people in the nation, but it still hadn't moved them to get over that hump of how do we translate awareness into true equity. So when he asked the question in 1967 about where do we go from here, it wasn't just about how do we enhance the awareness of other people in the nation and the federal government, but rather how do we not just allow progress to be converted to states' rights where it gets retarded, but rather allow us to really usher in true equality within the contents of that. So given that, I thought your focus on dialogues and equity makes sense in the moment, but we ought to have a little bit of a moment about what equity really represents in the context of, of, of schools given the size of LAUSD and the importance that it, it has really in uh, the nation as a whole. So equity for me, as far as our students go, suggests that students are provided with a standard set of opportunities to learn, to grow and develop. Equity means suggests that the markers used to assess and measure progress are reliable and valid indicators of their talents and achievements. Equity me suggests that the platform or, or, or environment, I guess, in which instructional and co-curricular learning takes place should provide a standard set of conditions where intellectual, emotional, and behavioral talents can be cultivated and nurtured irrespective of the demographic composition of the students and their families. And equity, my friends, suggests that the social rewards for personal achievement in school, in whatever system students are coming out of, the social rewards that exist in society are equally available to students to pursue and take advantage of in the context of reciprocal exchange, meaning if you are going to work hard, there ought to be a reward at the end of that that either results in admission to college, that results in good paying jobs, that results in active participation in the workforce and civic engagement, but something ought to come about as a result of the investment that you have made in your education. So if we're gonna have true equity, then that playing field has to be leveled as well in the context of, of, of our students. So specifically beyond the theoretical, what does equity look like pragmatically? I think it looks like these eight things. One, school systems have to have excellence in academics and co-curricular offerings. I think two, there has to be access to our institutions by our community residents. They have to have you know, easy access to what it is we offer. It has to be affordable for people to attend. And affordability is not simply about whether or not public school is free or not, but rather are public schools equipped with the resources necessary to make sure that a kid in South Central or in the body on East Los Angeles 
or all the way over in Beverly Hills have exactly the same resources irrespective of their tax base. Fourth, I think a curriculum that is culturally rich is really important there. Fifth, I think the instructional methodologies and the systems of pedagogy right, have to be aligned with the learning styles of the students that are being served in our schools. I think next, diversity and inclusive excellence is important among the faculty, staff, and the senior administration. And by diversity in this case, I'm not simply talking about skin color. There's a difference, my friend, between skin color and consciousness. So it doesn't do any good to have women in senior roles if they think just like their male counterparts. It doesn't do any good to have any black, brown, or purple people in the role if they think just like their white counterparts. True diversity demands that you have not only a diversity of thought, not simply right, a mixing of skin color. And also, I think true equity exists when students who enter our institutions actually complete their studies, receive their diplomas, and that those diplomas reflect the mastery of the subject matter that has been presented to them. So I offer those few thoughts as we get started today on what equity ought to look like. Now, in talking today, I've been asked to talk about both the importance of education and a little bit about my journey and a little piece about social circumstance that impact, I think, the life space of students. So being a university president, that provides me, I think, with an interesting perch from which to look at this whole notion of why is education important and really to, to um, interrogate that query. So first know that I believe that education is the civil rights issue of our day. It is the civil rights issue of our day. Access to education and a quality education I think is important. Second, and I say this even in our institutions of higher learning as a context, where we have intact cohorts of students who are anxious to do things like discover, to critique, to analyze information, to learn, to grow both personally and professionally. And we take that obligation very seriously as do you. On our university campus, for example, we have the privilege to help educate and teach students and try to dislodge them from those comfortable categories of intellectual, emotional, and behavioral apathy that keep them tied to the biases and assumptions they arrive at our doors with. We also have a mission to help them critically analyze information and news, debating different points of view with newfound facts and data so that they can help form more cogent and persuasive arguments that advance their positions and find their own voices. Let me say that again, find their own voices in the midst of all the echoes that represent both the numerous references they cite in writing their papers and test examinations, and the ones that sit around the family dinner tables and social gatherings that spew residues of bias, prejudice, and sometimes outright hate. And so hopefully what a more educated citizenry can help do is to challenge those biases and assumptions that people harbor towards those who are different. A more educated citizenry should not simply teach people about English and math and science and geography and politics, et cetera, but what it ought to do is provide people more enlightened ideas about the authenticity of people's humanity and hopefully try to dissipate some of the pockets of cultural ignorance that are too pervasive in America today. What thirdly, I think what education ought to do and what education to me is like, why is it important? Education for me is like that American Express card where you cannot leave home without it. And certainly that has been an important resource in my life. I think brother Malcolm was clear that education is the passport to the future for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for today. I think that's absolutely true. And fourth, I'm reminded that education and educational environments must be able to address both the tangible not just curriculum, but also the intangible that is part and parcel of what it is education, right, is supposed to represent. So what does that intangible mean? I think for our students, we've got to instill in them a sense of belonging, that they belong in our educational institutions. Why that sense of belonging? 
for too many students in other communities, and I see this happening a lot in, in, in higher education, if a white student stubs their toe, fails a test, gets a D, gets something, they make attribution that says, mm, maybe I need to try harder, maybe I need to figure out how to study more, maybe I think whatever, but there's really a question about whether they belong. For too many black and brown students that I see, there's a question about whether they even belong, particularly when they are first generation students who call home to say, mom, dad, I didn't do so well on a test. And the only advice they can get from parents who themselves have never been is, well, child, maybe college education is just not for you. We have to create in them a stronger sense of belonging. Secondly, I think we have to help them unlock what I call those shackles of conceptual incarceration. Let me say that again. We have to help them unlock those shackles of conceptual incarceration that have too many students devaluing their education and the skills that it will help them achieve. We've got to help students, and I see many of them, get past the notion that being able to conjugate a verb or calculate an algebraic formula or speak standard oral English is tantamount to being something other than Black, Latino, or Asian or something, right? That's a ridiculous notion that has even no basis in historical fact or history, but too many of our students embrace that piece. And also, I think school systems, in terms of our educational importance, have to help students overcome a mindset of poverty. And in overcoming that mindset of poverty, I want us really to accept the invitation to move past poverty as a concept that is purely economic and move to a space where poverty is more psychological. Because what I see, and I've talked to lots of, of, of uh, middle school and high school students as I'm out doing these various community programs over my career, I see a poverty of hope and optimism. I see a poverty of dreams and a deficit of aspirations that students have. I see a poverty of opportunity that exists for those students who don't believe there's opportunity beyond, right, what they can see in their immediate view. And also I see a poverty and a dampening of their spirit that affects the energy and initiative that students, right, bolster in order to just try to get things done and to achieve at their highest level. So part of the challenge we have to confront is being able to address that notion of poverty. Also, I would say that the central challenge in education, given how important I think it is, is to provide a higher degree of congruence between our intent and the actual policies and practices, right, that get played out every day on the schoolyards and in the classrooms of our primary, middle school, and high schools in our region. We have to close the gap my friends, between our stated mission, our goals and objectives, and the way in which those elements are operationalized and actualized every day in the context of our campus enterprises. That I think is why education to me is so important, but I think it means we have work to do. Now, let me shift also to talk about kind of overcoming circumstances. And I give you this, this fundamental assumption, I believe. Students, my friends, come from circumstance, but they are not their circumstance. We live in a society that assumes that circumstance is now related to your identity and a badge that you wear, that for some folk become an element of pride if you come from privilege, and some become an element of disappointment or disgrace because you come from a lack thereof. And so it's important for me that you understand in terms of circumstance, that students come from circumstance but are not their circumstance. I mean, here's what's true in our life. Poverty is still a norm for too many of our nation's children. Absolutely true. We also know in some respects that health disparities, we've certainly seen that in the pandemic, continue to exert right uh, uh, an inappropriate uh, and, and uh, unequal uh, impact on the lives, particularly of black and brown people. And the health disparities that exist in our life emerge uh, in utero at the time of our birth and continue throughout every developmental stage of our life. We see too much violence in the streets and in our homes. They make casualties of too many people in our communities. 
And those violence numbers, by the way, have skyrocketed during this pandemic. We know that contact with the police and other law enforcement agencies provides a, a, a different level of risk for our students of color. All that's true. We talked about poverty. There's poverty that inhibits our ability to provide for some of the basic necessities of life, like food, clothing, shelter, transportation, et cetera. And despite right, our best intentions and stated goals, there are schools and school personnel, schools and school personnel that students believe crush their academic dreams and aspirations. And so part of our challenge is to find a way to be able to address those pieces as well. Now, when I say that circumstances are places people come from, but not who they are at the core of their being, it's important that you understand who are these children that we teach and nurture every day. See, we may be poor financially challenged, but a student's spirit can still be rich. They may come from a violent surrounding, but still have a peaceful heart. They may perform poorly on a test in school, but that does not make them any less intellectually inclined or capable. And they might even commit a crime or go against a social norm. And once held accountable, that particular criminal activity does not make them a criminal by virtue of their nature. I'm reminded that the great Algerian psychiatrist, Franz Fanon, was clear when he argued that there were three fundamental questions, particularly people of African descent, but I would say whether you are black, white, blue, brown, or purple, they need to address. Question one was, who am I? Question two is, am I who I say I am? And question three, am I all I ought to be? Who am I is a question of identity. What is my nature, my essence, my character? So if you had to argue and describe who is and who are the students that we see every day? What is their identity? What is their nature, their essence, their character? I wonder how many of our teachers could really pass that test other than knowing right, the demographic makeup, the skin color, the social circumstance of our folk. For now, second question, am I who I say I am is a question of congruence, forcing us to examine the gap between who we say we are and who a student says he or she is and the behaviors that they engage in and we decide whether or not those behaviors converge with or diverge from that identity that the person wants to embrace. And am I all ought to be for Fanon was a question of right actualizing potential, meaning with all the ways in which that I have been blessed as an individual and your students have been blessed and my utilizing my potential to its fullest. Those three questions are important, but fundamentally what I'm suggesting here is that any discussion of a student's social circumstance should never ever lose sight that students, right, have a different sense of identity that is not tied to their social demographics. Who are these students? I believe students fundamentally are seeds of divinely inspired possibility. That when you nurture them in the proper context, they can and will grow into the fullest expression of all they are supposed to become. Let me say that again. Each of us, my friends and your students are seeds of divinely inspired possibility, which when nurtured in a proper context can and will grow into the fullest expression of all we are supposed to become. Your schools, your campuses are the soil into which those seeds of possibility are placed. Our job is to till the soil to make sure that they are very nurturing, to water it with those drops of intellectual nourishment, to feed it some nutrients, the miracle grow, if you will, that are the values orientation and that sense of belonging and, and the erasure of, of that poverty of mindset that is there to till the soil, to take the weeds of social distraction out of their life and to provide them with just enough sunlight of affirmation and just enough shade of critique when they get off and they just stand back and watch them grow into the fullest expression of all they are supposed to become. These students are more than just the test grade they uh, receive. 
and more than the social circumstance they emerge from, they are seeds of divinely inspired possibility. And our job is to treat them like such in our educational endeavors. Now, let me shift from that to talk about my own educational journey and spend a minute on that so we can get to some of the questions. So I describe myself, I think, in the title as just kind of round away brother. Because while I've been blessed with a lot of privilege and have wound up being a university president, I'm a celebrated psychologist and author and academician and clinician to do all those things. I've seen patients all my professional life except the last few years. Um, I really am just a round away brother who grew up in LA. I grew up in a single parent household with a mom and three siblings. I have two brothers and a sister. One, uh, my sister's the oldest, my older brother, myself, and then a younger brother. We received a mix of both public and private school education. So I think in about the fifth grade, my brother and sister who were older were about to enter middle school, uh, what we call junior high school back in the day, where you went seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. And my mother decided that she was gonna put them in Catholic school. And so there we all decided that we were going to Catholic school, I guess, she decided. So I spent fifth through the 12th grade uh, in uh, Catholic school. And then after uh, graduating from high school, then was involved in public education the rest of my, uh, uh, rest of my academic journey. Also, for myself, I was a very relational child who performed well in a nurturing environment and could care less if I thought the teacher or instructor cared less or was hostile toward me as a student. How many of our teachers teach relational children who can be on task but value relationship as much as they value that task that's there? And I mentioned that in the context of even this virtual environment because one of the things that is so difficult to replicate in this virtual space is the relational aspect, right, of what it is that we want to uh, uh, convey to the students that we teach. I was also very blessed to be bright and intellectually capable. Uh, in the past, I could go to class and pay attention and still do better than most people who studied all night long. I was even like that through, you know, middle school, high school, and even into college. Except there's a piece of African wisdom I've stylized over time in my writing that says that life at its best is a creative synthesis of opposites and fruitful harmony. It has a lot of different meanings. Life at its best is a creative synthesis of opposites and fruitful harmony. Being bright was one of the biggest blessings in my life, but being bright also made me a lazy student because I didn't have to work hard. And so part of the challenge was what motivated me to want to work harder right, was the investment of that instructional aid, that teacher, that uh, assistant principal, that principal who somehow cared enough to say, child, you know, congratulations on what you just did, or straighten up, you got more potential than what you're using, you know, get up and use that. That piece was important for me, I think, as a student going forward, and I hope uh, important for you as, as uh, administrators who navigate this educational space. I was also blessed, my friends, with a warrior spirit. Uh, one of the things I share is a birthday with Nat Turner. And so the warrior spirit has allowed me to be able to use my voice to be able to, to not simply echo, but to really help seize power by defining and framing the discourse about what the critical issues of our time should be. In every space that I have been, in whatever school that I have been in, whatever university I've been in, whatever graduate school I have been in, whatever faculty position I've been in, in whatever administrative position that I've been in, have always been used to be in those spaces. I've also, my friends, benefited from superb mentoring. And to the degree that we can invite students to uh, get access to mentors, both in the school as well as in the community, I think is important because what superb mentoring did was help solidify, right, a belief in my ability because the mentors knew that and communicated that. Mentors advised me 
to simply produce excellence. And excellence would bring opportunity. That certainly has been true in my life. And so when I went to places and I finally kind of woke up to this notion with that first mentor in my life in my undergraduate years at the University of California at Irvine, it was pretty Im Im important to me to understand why that was a, a essential ingredient in being able to, to um, propel my achievement. But that was the first lesson I think that has continued to pay dividends. And my teachers told me, said, you will never have to tell anybody how bright and capable you are. Just produce excellence and excellence will bring you opportunity. My mentors also taught me that the key to mental health, particularly for a young African-American male, was always having a broad range of choices and options in life. So I've always tried to generate as many options and choices there, never knowing right, what circumstance would dictate, but trying to be prepared across whatever domain I had to function in to be able to work with that. So as I came out to be both a faculty member providing instruction, a researcher who could go to toe to toe with the best doing research and scholarship and statistically analyze and multiple regression and et cetera, where I could be, you know, have clinical acumen to be able to see patients, where I could also consult. I could talk to crowds that were as small as 50 in arenas. I've been in that have talked to crowds as big as 10,000, right? You've got to be able to be versatile because you never know where the opportunity is going to be. But the key to mental health was having a broad range of choices and options. And finally, one of the most profound lessons my mentor, my first one taught me, actually, is you cannot seek validation from your oppressor. The fact that there are people who may have a negative idea of you, who may have a racist or a sexist idea, a homophobic idea, whatever it might be, is not the problem. The problem he taught me is that you give a damn about what they think about you in the first place. You cannot seek validation from your oppressor. And I think that's an important lesson for us to be able to teach our students. I also had an opportunity, right, through all that mentoring, through the guidance, through the achievement I was able to do to successfully wrestle with the question of identity. Because I think the, the, the mixture of that is a question for any professional of color in whatever station you rise to. And it's no different for me when I was a graduate student uh, or when I was you know, appointed a university president. The fundamental question for us is always, right? People of color and women in particular, is how does one maintain a sense of their own cultural integrity? in a world that does not support or affirm your humanity as a person of X, fill in the blank. For me, it was a male of African descent. How do I maintain a sense of cultural integrity in a world that doesn't support or affirm my humanity as a person of African descent? It was an important space to be able to be in. Also, the great psychiatrist Franz Fanon, beyond the three critical questions also reminds us that each generation out of relative obscurity must reach out and seek to fulfill its legacy or betray it. So I go to work every day. I went to graduate school every day to study. I pursued my jobs, whether they're clinical, the academic, the research, the consultative, all those platforms have been used to say, with the legacy that I have been blessed to inherit, am I fulfilling it or betraying it? And my constant wish is that I am fulfilling the legacy that I've been blessed to inherit by the elders and the ancestors and the sacrifices that uh, my mom made, that other folks have made and the grace of God that has blessed me with the talent that I have. And also, I would say that what is important for me is to be able to pay it forward. I remember before I left for graduate school, uh, I was mentored by the great Joe White. He was my first mentor and kind of the father of the contemporary black psychology movement. Um, my second mentor was Horace Mitchell when I was in grad school, who's probably one of the finest examples of conscious manhood that I've met. And my third mentor, uh, the great Janet Helms, uh, just serious intellectual scholar uh, I know who uh, nurtured me in my doctoral program uh, and forced you to kind of produce excellence, uh, much like a queen mother did. But I remember before going to grad school, we all took my first mentor, Joe White, out to dinner. And we said, Joe, how do we thank you for the investment you've made in us as students? There were two friends of mine, all of which are psychologists now and PhD. 
And he said, I appreciate your thanks, but don't need it. But what I do expect is whatever I do for you, you will do for other people. So we learned very early to pay it forward. So even over these years and 30, 40 years we've been doing this, people say, Dr. P, how can I you know, help you know, to, to thank you to do that? Or I want to be like you. I'm like, no, no, no. Your job is not to be like me. Your job is to take my little bitty stuff and take it to a whole different level. Your job is not to thank me. I appreciate your thanks. But your job is to do for other people what I try to do for you. And in that way, my friends, we are able to pay it forward. So I hope today in this dialogue and equity that some of you, in fact, would even discover, right, who you are at the core of your being and reconnect with your culture that is often invisible in a climate of cultural sterility that is so pervasive, I think, in society. That also you would reconnect with that notion of who our students really are at the core of their being. That you would understand that there were some key elements that helped a round the way brother like me navigate my way through LA Unified back in the day and in parochial schools and Catholic schools as I went through and then through public and private education uh, uh, in my uh, graduate work to help arrive at this particular space and time that I see. And I hope that right, you would all know how grateful and thankful I am for your invitation to address you today and be a part of this dialogue and equity series. So with that, let me stop and see if we've got about 20 minutes for some Q&A. And thank you very much, Michelle Woods, for inviting me to be in this space. Thank you so much, Dr. Parham, and so much that you have um, shared with us and your your questions of who am I and, and am I who I say I am, you know, that, that's, that's so deep, you know, just to think about we're always being, um, you know, uh, trying to tell students what to do and your instructors and so on, what you should do, but then really looking and reflecting on who we are, you know, that's something that I don't think I, you know, take that time, you know, to think about who I am and how, how I best can serve. Um, you talked about uh, mentorship. Your mentoring, was that someone who came to you to mentor or did you seek them out? So my first mentor, uh, I had arrived actually as a transfer student. I started out college at California State University, Long Beach. Mm -hmm when I was pursuing a, a, a career in criminal justice. I mean, growing up in LAPD, I've been up against the wall, you know, with a racial epithet thrown at me by the police, just cause I look suspicious, right? Mm -hmm. And so my mama always used to say, son, you have no business complaining about anything unless you're willing to put something better in this place. I figured I could put something better in this place. And I had to navigate that, that, that psychic tension and dissonance about what's the best way to achieve social progress, particularly for a young African-American male. Was it a more integrationist posture that it's more aligned with kind of a Kingian philosophy or a more culturally nationalistic policy, i.e. Um, uh, aligned with someone like a Malcolm or maybe even a Marcus Garvey. So I opted for the integrationist piece, assuming that I would maybe be a criminal defense attorney or maybe even a police officer on going into LAPD to say, if you want to change it, get up in it and try to change it. But ultimately I became frustrated with the criminal justice system because it was not really about the truth and justice that I really wanted to achieve for people in life, but it required more ability to kind of uh, manipulate the system than it did really to help people. But fortunately in my uh, uh, co-curricular learning at Long Beach, I had a chance to participate in a program that was run by a sister named Ruby Beal back in the day Mm -hmm. That was called EPIC, Educational Participation in the Community. Now they call it service learning. And I worked at a halfway house for so-called incorrigible and runaway kids. And then at a um, uh, community psychology clinic that was in downtown Long Beach back then. And that's where my passion for psychology was born. And I knew that I had to be in a place that was going to challenge me intellectually. So I transferred to the University of California, Irvine. So to your question now. Uh, I took my first class in African-American psychology from the great Joe White. He was the father of the whole contemporary black psychology movement in a place like Irvine, no less in Orange County. And maybe two months after uh, we were in class, I'm walking down the walkway and he's coming from the other way. I think it was around lunchtime. So he must have been coming from the faculty club. 
And much like any student would do respectfully, I said, hey, Dr. White, how you doing? Good afternoon. And he simply, Michelle, he walked up to me and he put his arm around me. Mm -hmm. And exactly what he said. He said, young brother, he said, you have too much talent and you are too brilliant to be running around here playing basketball, chasing women. <laughs> True story. Come follow me. And he took me up to his office and made an appointment for about a week later. And at that appointment, he diagrammed my whole future upon a chalkboard that was, you know, 20 by 30. And we had chalkboards back then, not the dry erase boards we have now. Mm -hmm. But true enough, if everything didn't happen. So he sought me out. And then as I have been blessed to go along with different parts of my career, uh, folk have just decided to kind of adopt you in the mentoring if they see that you're working hard or doing that. But I think that you can be mentored personally in those spaces, but you can also be mentored intellectually through reading. Right. A lot of mentoring I've received is because I read so doggone much. Um, and so, you know, uh, I've never met some of the people. I didn't meet Malcolm, but I read a lot that he wrote. I didn't, you know, you can't study Malcolm and not study his teacher. I never met Dr. King, but I read everything he wrote. Right. You know, I mean, those things I think are important in terms of the mentoring, but I think you can be both. I was fortunate enough to have people adopt me, but I think students, I've had students in my life who have come and sought me out as a mentor, which I have always, you know, gladly adopted and achieved. So, yeah. Dr. Parham, this is Julie Hall. We have a question in the Q&A for you. Um, the question is, how did you learn to distill all of this information that you shared with us? And how do you come to terms with leaving out things that may have felt just as important as the things you kept in this share of? Uh, that sounds like that oldie but goodie song James Brown wrote that said, Bobby, I don't know. Um, the short answer is, I don't know me that the, you know, whenever you're just in the moment in the space and time, you know, there's this huge reservoir of information that is just in there and knowledge belongs to the universe. And once you have a chance to access it, being able to then synthesize it into a place that helps to make a, a coherent uh, presentation, it's just kind of what they do. I mean, part of the theme and the questions that were asked of me is, what about the importance of education, social circumstance, and you know, something about your own journey? So what I framed was really in that context, but had you given me a different theme and said, talk about X, Y, or Z, I might've gone there too. Um, but part of it is also just what I'm feeling in the moment and being in touch with that spirit and energy and being in that space. Uh, oftentimes I try to feed off the crowd, but since I can't see you now in this virtual space, right? I'm vibing off that energy that I see from, you know, Michelle and Jamila and Danielle and Julie and Alva and, right, Murdis and all the other folk and Natalia. So it's, it's, it's the, the board who's probably giving me my energy right now. Next question. Okay, the next question is from Kimberly Mitchell. She said she was a student at UC Irvine and she remembers you, that you were big on student engagement and participation. And she said, do you have any suggestions on how we increase student engagement in this current setting and its importance? So, um, hi, Kimberly Mitchell. Um, yeah, I used to, when I would teach a class, I mean, my classes got pretty popular. They grew from about 30 and I had to cap them at about 110 students in a class because I couldn't literally learn the names of more than 110 people at a time. But one of the techniques I would do that probably Kimberly remembers is I would take a manila folder, much like uh, one of these I have on my desk. I would make a student cut it in half and bend it over and I would have them make a name card out of it so that they would have to display that on the front of their desk. And it helped me to one, learn their names, but also I would walk them down the aisles and call on folk. And I would tell them, that the only person who's about to get embarrassed if you haven't done your reading for the day is not me. It's going to be you because when I call on you and you go, oh, blah, 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 you know, I don't know. So let me encourage you to read, to engage, to study, to help share and educate the rest of us about your perspective. And so that level of engagement allowed us to be able to do some things as a technique in the classroom. I also use the Socratic method by questioning first rather than just providing instruction. Mm -hmm. And also, I think, use case study that force folk to have to figure out, like, hmm, let me think through what's going on with the situation. And then you use content 
the best way to teach content in my mind is through problem solving. And so they have problems to solve with the case study and then being able to do the content was a way to kind of engage them because they were involved in kind of the exercise of that rather than coming into a classroom where it was very didactic and all I was doing was lecturing on the board and not engaging students in the proper way. I think in this virtual space, we are challenged to be able to do the same thing and we just have to be more creative to it, but you can still provide exercise you can still make students, you know, their names are in the queue if you put them on there, but you can also call on them in ways in which you don't, you know, just engage in passive learning. You can also do active engagement with um, uh, activities so that you can teach concepts by being more uh, uh, energy focused to help students burn up some of that energy instead of just sitting staring at a computer screen all day long. Um, I mean, those are some of the things that I would do, particularly in a virtual space, but also get students in a virtual space just to kind of stand up, stretch, do, engage, say something, you know, funny, what was, how were you blessed today, whatever, that just allow people to share. I think all that's important in a virtual space because we have so little time to be able to do that. Okay, we have one more question from Esteban Leiva. You spoke about maintaining your integrity how have you been able to maintain your cultural and personal integrity while navigating the academic world, which is especially critical, unwelcoming, and unforgiving to people of color? So again, my first mentor taught me that you can't seek validation from your oppressor. And so I've always, excuse that siren outside my window, um, I've always uh, had a mindset of wanting to do that. It's like, I, I've not been blessed with a, a great deal of fear about the consequences if somehow people didn't quite like the presentation that I was making. You know, the question for lots of us is never, do we know what the right thing to do is? The question is, what are we prepared to sacrifice and risk? So when I'm a graduate student and I'm bringing up these issues, I remember uh, writing a paper, I wanna say it was a personality theory class, in fact, yeah, it was. And this is the first week of grad school and I'm in my master's program at Washington University in St. Louis. That's the Harvard of the Midwest, they call it. And the paper assignment is, it was due in like the first week. You have five days to write it. It's 12 page, 10 page paper, something like that on your theory of personality. So they were trying to teach you how theories are constructed. So there's really no right answer to the question. Well, I just now get trained by Joe White, who's the father of black psychology. So the first eight and a half pages are all kind of traditional. My theory is blank and I think this and I believe that. The last page and a half is, you know, all the stuff about, yeah, but part of the problem is when you adopt Eurocentric theories and try to use them to apply to the people of color, blah, 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 blah. And when I get the paper back, I get an A minus grade. Now everybody around me, my peers are like, ooh, that's great. You got an A minus, I'm pissed off. That minus. <laughs> and I'm mad because I got that minus. And I'm like, what did I do wrong? That's the first thing you always look at, right? So the first, you know, six, seven pages, great point, brilliant insight, blah, 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 good stuff. And when I got to the cultural stuff on the last page and a half, it was all kind of red marks to it. And the teacher actually wrote, what is this shit on mm -hmm. my paper in graduate school? So now I got, the, I got a choice. My purpose in grad school at that point was to try to debate the teacher about the error of her ways in her class, or was it my point to get an A, to get my degree, and to get out of there and keep on moving? So mm -hmm. I just mm, was clear that they didn't want to hear what I had to say and just wrote what they wanted to write, got an A out the class, got my master's degree. I had a 4.0 when I applied to my doctoral program, made it through there and did fine. And now institutions like that have to pay me big money to come back and say the same thing they didn't want to hear about years ago when I was a graduate student. <laughs> so in some cases, who won that war? The question is not, do we know what the right thing to do is? The question is, what are we prepared to sacrifice? But also, you have to have some, some game, some intelligence about, right, what will a system tolerate in terms of you being able to push the boundaries? In that climate, that instructor was not prepared to tolerate any movement. So I just kind of hunkered down and did what I needed to do. But when I was at University of Pennsylvania, when I was at UC Irvine, when I've been in the communities, as I push the boundary, I'm always willing to push the boundary, but have never been afraid of whether or not I would lose right. my job or not, because I always figured I could get another job any place. Right. Part of producing excellence is giving you that kind of, of, of confidence and knowing that you have enough ability in your skill. 
And lastly, I never wanted to violate that sense of integrity in my own life that would have me come and not be able to live with myself because somehow I did not value and in fact betrayed the legacy that the ancestors had allowed me to inherit. So I have a question, it's off a little bit. So LA Unified is about to go through the implicit bias training. And my wondering is, are the universities also um, preparing for that? Are, are you already doing that as far as the implicit bias training? The implicit bias training has been part of university curriculum for a number of years now. Mm -hmm. uh, we were doing that. I've been, this is what my third year at Dominguez Hills. Um, delighted and blessed to be here. Uh, but we were doing that even when I was back at Irvine, you know, before then. So it's been around for a while. Um, not only are they doing implicit biases training, but even trying to look for ways to do what we call restorative justice work yeah. as well in helping people kind of resolve conflicts, et cetera. Um, the challenge, I think, with some of the implicit bias training, though, uh, to me, because I think it's well intended and it's, it's very valuable, is that it isn't necessarily good about holding systems accountable in the way in which they should be held accountable for diversity progress. So if your progress you know, milestone and marker is we got 20 people to go through implicit bias training as opposed to we used to have zero, that's nice. And it's one step in a successive approximation, you know, kind of, 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 of uh, a continuum. But if it doesn't fundamentally lead to behavior change and the policies and practices that in fact are creating the inequities in the first place, then all you're doing is touching the surface, but not really getting to the level of the deep structure. So I think the implicit bias training is important. If LA Unified is doing it, it's great. There's a lot of bias and assumption that goes into right, what goes on in the kids. And that's why so many kids believe that their hopes and dreams and aspirations are not being supported, but are being crushed by some of the instructional personnel that are in these classrooms working with our kids. But if it doesn't fundamentally lead to behavior change, not simply a marker on the thing to say we had X percentage of people participate in the, in the uh, exercise, then I don't know that it does much good. Or I don't know that it does as good as it could be doing right. if we also had a system of accountability in place. It's probably a better way to say that. All right. well, thank you, thank you. Other questions? The questions, yes. Now's your time to ask. <laughs> I see another person in the chat who said they received their teaching credential uh, and administrative credential from CSUDH, so go Toro. So <laughs> delighted to see that. We, we train an awful lot of teachers in LA Unified at Dominguez Hill, so I'm uh, delighted that that's yeah. a big badge of honor for us. I remember taking classes at uh, Dominguez, math classes, so yes. <laughs> going toward, and then going toward my credential. So thank you, thank you. So if there are no more questions, again, uh, Dr. Parham. I do have a question, go ahead, a go quick ahead. one. So would your, so my, what would be your advice? Because in your comment just now, you acknowledged that some of the students, like their dreams are potentially being crushed by your oppressor. instructors in these institutions who um, might've checked off that implicit bias tab like I did it but their actions are not that way what would be your advice would your advice be the same that was yours initially when you said you know you realize with that one instructor okay I'm not going toe-to-toe -to -toe with him I'm going to go ahead pass the class do what he wants because generation z they're kind of different right now right so when we try to give them that advice they're not hearing from us what advice would you give to a young black man going through that or a young black woman well, part of that, first of all, it was the faculty member was a woman, not a man, um, a Stanford educated woman, by the way, who was teaching there, but that's a story for another day. But um, for students, I think one of the other lessons that Joe White taught me, again, is you have to always assess what an environment will tolerate. That's a skill that our kids already know when they do like sequential analysis. Like no student walks in, if you, if you put a, a, a dance at the school, at the middle school, at the high school. Nobody just walks into the dance and just runs on the dance floor and grabs the first person they see and say, let's dance. 
they engage in a process that we call sequential analysis, where they'll sit back, they'll lay back, get all cool, and they'll kind of see who's in the room and mm -hmm. who do I want to talk to and who, no, nah, let me stay away from them. And you're right, they kind of analyze the situation and they assess what things are looking like. Well, it's the same skill just applied in a different context. You know, all systems have a, a, a tolerance level for both holding on to what is traditional and for being able to push the boundaries, right? Of what things they want to take place. When I was at the, when I was a faculty member at the University of Pennsylvania, and I became back in the early 80s, 1982, when I got hired by them, the first African American academic psychologist, the University of Pennsylvania, ever hired in its 200 something year history after it was founded by Ben Franklin back in 17 something something. Now that's an interesting commentary, but almost a disgrace, right? And they had other black faculty members in other disciplines, but none in psychology. So as I'm sitting in a city like Philadelphia that's 44% black, just got their first mayor in Wilson Good, and I'm looking at this space and we're training masters and doctoral students in that program, as well as teaching undergrads, but training doctoral students to go out and administer psychological services to a population that was 44% black. And we had no course in multicultural counseling or in African-American psychology. So I said, in fact, I mean, I said, excuse me, like somewhere I read in the annals of the American Psychological Association that it should be unethical to practice outside of your scope of competence. So how are we training students with a doctor degree to go out here and render psychological service and they know nothing about the patient populations they're working with because you can't assume that all of them are the same, right? Yeah. And the same way that Freud said. And just because you train a black student, we can't just put some shoe polish on Freud and assume somehow that's gonna be okay, right? Well, I had colleagues, these are friends now, not even hostile intent who whispered to me, they said, that's not a way to make tenure. Because the carrot for everybody was, aunt, you got to do tenure, you got to do what the senior faculty say. Well, silly me. You know, I wouldn't, my goal wasn't to do tenure. I was going to make tenure by producing excellence. And if Penn decided not to give me a reappointment, I figured I could get a job any place. So my question at that point, right, uh, uh, Jamila was, how could I push the boundary in a way that allowed them to deal with what was, a, you know, I think a fundamental question about ethical practice in a population that we were supposed to be training people to serve and the incongruence that we were promoting in the department. Well, we had some little kind of knockdown drag outs on faculty meetings over that year. But right now, you cannot graduate from that doctor program at the University of Pennsylvania even all these years later without having a mandatory course on African-American psychology that I developed, mm. even way back then. And by the way, five assistant professors went up across that school, right? And one of them got through in that, that first three year review. That would be yours truly. Why? Because I was able to produce excellence in the other places. You know, I really place, they gonna look at your research and I'm publishing in the best journals and getting the best review. It's like you produce excellence and excellence will bring you opportunity, but it also insulates you from a little bit of scrutiny. And if Penn had decided, you know what, Parham, it ain't working out here, you got to go, I'd have simply said, fine, I can apply for a job any place I want to in the country, it's all good with me. I just wasn't afraid of, of having to take on that, 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 that burden um, because, you know, for me, I knew what the right thing to do was. The question was, what was I prepared to sacrifice? And that's what we have to be able to teach our students. So back to your question, Jamila, we got to teach our students to produce excellence. We got to teach them to sequentially analyze and assess what an environment will tolerate. Mm -hmm. But third, we have to write much like this generation, you know, uh, change always comes not on the wheels of inevitability, right? As Martin Luther King reminds us, change comes on the backs of some young people who have this energy to be able to get out there and like push the boundaries and ways in which that are sometimes not always socially constructive, but, that force us in the adult world and now come back and say, wow, I'm getting a point, what can we do differently? They have to be, know what are they prepared to sacrifice, but not cut their nose off to you know, spike their face in order to right, achieve the progress they wanna be able to achieve. Well, thank you, Dr. Parham. I know some uh, members will have to um, leave um, for the lunch hour, but I do have, I have a question. Um, about the uh, black male recruitment. 
how are you preparing uh, or how's the university preparing for uh, black recruit black male recruitment um, that's just a low you know we see it the numbers are very low and students are male students especially they don't see anyone who looks like them in front of the, the uh, African-American black male. So if you look at the Dominguez Hill story, there are a couple places that are there. Uh, one, we have a program called the Male Success Alliance. Mm -hmm. And that MSA program that is really award-winning is developed by my vice president for student affairs another African-American male, Dr. William Franklin, who's a dynamic individual, uh, who would also be a good person. I think you might want to think about it, inviting to your uh, dialogue and, and equity series. Uh, but Dr. Franklin in developing that MSA has a group of students, not exclusively black, but a lot of black males mm -hmm. who are not only working to support students on campus, but actually reaching out into local schools to be able to create a pipeline of mentorship and support and guidance for those students who are in those spaces as well, so that they can actually see, you know, themselves reflected in the students that are there, as well as the supports that we provide to students on campus. And they have a whole big old Male Success Alliance club. They have jackets with, you know, patches on, on, on the breast and whatever. I mean, they dress and tab and act like responsible, you know, young black and Latino males and a couple of white students in there, Asian students. I mean, it's a very multiculturally mixed, but it's principally uh, with a lot of black students. The other piece is that I'm a hands-on uh, university leader. And so in most of the admissions videos, you'll see us sending out to schools. I want folk to see that there is in fact an African-American male in charge of that institution and one who is socially conscious in that space and one who is trying to grow the demographic diversity, particularly among those folk. So I'm actually in some of these videos encouraging folk to come through and whether it was about completing your applications in the midst of COVID, whether it's about congratulating students on their graduation spaces, whether it's about um, you know, doing anything, I try to make myself available and visible to folk so that they can say, I, I want to come study with somebody like that, because I think the Mingo Hills is a great environment for students to be in, particularly about the way in which we're transforming that particular campus. So, um, and I'm going to correct that, myself because uh, I really uh, should have said um, the men of color. Because um, I agree with you, you know, I, I had an all male uh, academy at the school that I was a principal at, and um, it was the the men who showed that passion, and that mentorship, and it was a it was diverse group. So you know, I correct myself on that. You know, no, uh, that was that's part and parcel of what, what what that is. But it's also important to remember that my activities, at least, have not been confined solely to. Uh, the academic institution. So when I was a member for years of the local 100 Black Men, I'm a founding member of the 100 Black Men of Orange County chapter mm -hmm. that we founded way back in the, in the day, probably 30 years ago. And in the midst of that, um, we had put together a, a program that uh, we titled Passport to the Future. That was an African-centered model of manhood training designed to supplement what it is that folk would learn in the schools. And because I understood that, you know, one of the biggest challenges they face, as I said earlier, was that need for mental liberation. We had to find a model that would help them unlock the shackles of conceptual incarceration that were on the brains of our kids. Mm -hmm. And so being a psychologist, that was my forte. And we put that program in place that won some awards as well. For, and I think the, the Orange County chapter in Hunt Black Men that I'm no longer a, a member of because I'm, I'm out of that environment would work, but it also elevated me producing excellence to get an invitation to now be the chair of education for all of the national Hunt Black Men nationally and worldwide. So I served in that capacity for a while. So there are all kinds of ways to make that difference, but it doesn't just happen in our schools and universities. It also happens in our communities with our nonprofit entities that I would encourage you to take advantage of. There's a hundred black men chapter right here in LA, which is one of the largest and one of the oldest. As a matter of fact, there's one in Long Beach uh, that is doing some great work in addition to the one in um, uh, uh, Orange County, uh, as well as a national body. And that might be the way to help uh, uh, to get some of that work done as well. Okay, thank you, thank you. So do we have any more questions? Dr. Parham, again, just, just so grateful that you uh, were able to speak with us today. 
Um, I, I took down uh, Dr. Franklin's name, so also uh, possibility of presentation for you know this year to share with us and um, really appreciate you. So uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Good. Well, no, I thank you. In fact, I'm running to my next. Uh, Zoom okay. Call. Okay. Well, I'm a little. I'm a little late thank for. You. Uh, but I wanted to make sure I, I was responsive to all your questions. Let me also. Um, you know, how do you pay it forward? It's been my pleasure to be here. But if we leave this space and we don't have a commitment to have you folk use your platform to yeah. let your students in LA Unified know, particularly some of those males you were just talking about, right? that there is a home for them in places like California State University, Dominguez Hill, then mm -hmm. we have not done our job. Uh, we have the largest percentage, by the way. We're, we are 64% Latinx students on that campus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have about 11, not quite 12% African-American students, which is the largest percentage of black students of any public university in this entire state of California. So mm -hmm. we're trying to grow that population back to where it used to be. We've got about eight and a half, nine percent Asian-American folks. We've got almost 90% students of color on their campus, about eight and a half percent Caucasian. I mean, we are very multiculturally diverse, less than 1% African-American or um, um, uh, Native American students. So we're very culture diverse, 70% women. I mean, it's a great campus to be on. Right. And with the transformation we have done, if I can just highlight with my screen, I don't know if I can do this in my last few seconds before I jump off this call, but we are literally transforming the campus. So if you wanna know what it looks like, this is kind of my campus as you see it historically. Mm -hmm. but this is our brand new science and innovation building wow. that we've just opened up. It is one of the first buildings with any portion of state money they built on the campus in 25 years. Uh, on top of that, uh, we are just completing, this building is about 95% done. This is our new innovation and instruction building. So that science building will flank the south end of campus. This building is right along Victoria. So here's another view of it from the Victoria side. Yeah. This is our new innovation instruction building that will house our College of Business Administration and Public Policy where also criminal justice is. And we've just finished a new 506 space residence hall complex that is the first down payment on, uh, you know, enhancing, I think, our uh, residence hall capability because I want to be less of a commuter campus and more of a um, residential one. Mm -hmm. And so these are the kind of things that we are doing. We're transforming curriculum. We've just put a new women's studies program in place an Asian Pacific Islander uh, curriculum in place and major that you can now graduate in along with African American studies and uh, Chicano Latino studies. I mean, there's so many, there's six colleges, uh, about 69, 67 majors, 22 graduate, 47 um, undergraduate majors. That is just phenomenal. So we want to encourage you to let your students know about the values and virtues of a CSUDH education. So with that, I'll stop and say it has been my pleasure to be with you. I thank you again for the invitation. I hope something I said made a difference today and inspired somebody to go out there and keep doing the work and know that I honor very sincerely the work you all do as part of this educational enterprise because there is no greater blessing in life next to being a parent than being entrusted with the personal and intellectual growth and development of our children. With that, it's been my pleasure. Take care. God bless. Stay healthy and well. Thank you so much, so much. Thank you.